Hello, friends. This is Science Talk. I am your host, Jim Massa. And as you can see right here, I am going to discuss with you overturned mixing and stratification in freshwater and saltwater systems. So you've heard me discuss in other video segments I have done where I mention about, you know, that you need a mixing regime followed by a stratification for uh, productivity to take place and, and follow forth. And I've talked about ice edge productivity, how the impact of less and less uh, Arctic sea ice will affect that, and, uh, as well as other issues at hand involving uh, productivity and so forth. So I thought I put together, and this is a lengthy uh, presentation, but I thought I put this together to explain what's happening and why the mixing stratification is required to have productivity in water. Because when you come right down to it, planet Earth is really a water planet. And most of the productivity is the result of freshwater, saltwater primary producers. Phytoplankton uh, account for the production of at least 55 up to 80% of the oxygen in the air that we breathe. And anything that's going to affect uh, their ability to uh, to carry on primary productivity and create that oxygen we need is going to affect not only us, but all uh, heterotrophic organisms. So let's get into this. I'm going to start this by looking at fresh water. Uh, it's a little easier to understand it by examining fresh water first before we get into marine water. Now, don't let the math freak you out, but this is what we do. Okay, so that in, in freshwater systems, density is a function of temperature only. Now, this looks like a, a letter P, but it's not. It's the Greek letter rho, R-H-O, the Greek letter rho. So what this is saying is, and we use rho as the symbol for density. So we're saying that density is a function of temperature. Capital T is the variable we use for temperature. Small case T is time. So you, so you want to keep those straight. So if we want to know the rate of change of density with respect to temperature, we state, and this is a derivative, d rho dt. The rate of change in density with the respect to the rate of change in temperature. This is called a total derivative because density in freshwater only relies on the temperature. Density being the dependent variable, temperature the only independent variable. Okay. So if we want to now know the rate of change of density over time, since density depends on temperature, we need a derivative of temperature with respect to time. So we write d rho dt, see the small case t, that's time, is equal to d rho dt, capital T, which is this derivative, times dt dt, okay, d big t, d little t. So this is the, the rate of change of density with respect to temperature times the rate of change of temperature with respect to time. So in this first case here, temperature is the independent variable, but over here, temperature now becomes the dependent variable. And this is, the way it's written here, you can almost think of it as like, like if you wrote x squared over x, right, you, you can reduce an x from both numerator and denominator to have x over 1. Or if you had, you know, x to the fourth over x uh, squared, you can reduce it x squared and so on. So it's almost like the, the d big t's cancel, leaving with d rho dt equals d rho dt. In calculus, we call this a chain rule. Kind of, and this is a, a typical type of computations we often do. But this is, you know, and I'm presenting this to you so you understand how when we examine long-term changes or changes in with respect to density of temperature, long-term change, this is what we're doing. I haven't plugged in any specific formulas, but we could plug in specific formulas and take out derivatives, et cetera. So, so keep this in mind because later on we're going to be expanding this when we get to our discussion on oceanics uh, and saltwater systems.
But before we go any further, let's talk Klein's. Klein, a, okay, that's where we see a sharp change in something. So a thermocline is a sharp change or a steep gradient, a gradient, a gradient, steep gradient in temperature over a small change in depth. And we see thermoclines tip, uh, we see thermoclines abundant uh, in tropical oceans, uh, freshwater lakes, freshwater ponds. Halo client is a sharp change, steep gradient in the salt content, which we refer to as salinity over a small change in depth. Halo clients is something we see uh, a lot in high latitudes, like polar region, where temperatures tend to be cold, the water temperature, and the salt content is always changing over depth. You know, you might have, you know, the, the salt water freezes, forming sea ice, but increasing the salinity or the the sea ice in the spring summer melts creating a, uh, a freshwater lens that will decrease the salinity and therefore you get a sharp change in the salt content over quick depth so we see that a lot pycnocline is a sharp change a steep gradient in density over a small change in depth now in freshwater systems pycnocline and thermocline typically are the same in oceanic systems, since the density of seawater is a function of the temperature and its salt content, the pycnocline does not necessarily correspond to the thermocline or the halocline. Sometimes it can, sometimes it doesn't. So this is a, a very, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit different, a bit more fluid over, say, looking at the halocline or the thermocline. It depends on what portion of the ocean you are finding yourselves in. Lysocline is a sharp change, steep grading in the calcite concentration levels over a small change in depth. I did a video segment discussing uh, the CCD and uh, CCD calcite uh, compensation depth. So you may want to check out that. Usually below the lysocline, calcite stays in solution above the lysocline calcite will precipitate this is how organisms are able to make their shells or test they're usually above the the uh the lysocline so the the calcite that's in the water they, they can precipitate that in, as they create their shells a problem with increasing acidity of the ocean is that the lysocline is moving up in the water column i.e becoming shallower and this is affecting the organisms because if it gets so shallow and you know they're living say below the lysocline they're not able to make their their shells they are increased risk for mortality an oxycline is a sharp change steep gradient in the oxygen levels over a small change in depth and that could lead to uh, layers of the water column that are hypoxic low oxygen level or anoxic no oxygen levels and then we have a nutricline, which is a sharp change, steep gradient in the nutrient concentration, be it nitrates, phosphates, what have you, over a small change in depth. Usually, if you have a sharp uh, change in oxygen levels, i.e. an oxycline, where you end up with an anoxic region, uh, you're not going to find nutrients in that anoxic water layer as well, and it's not going to be any productivity, no life forms uh, there at all or at least life forms that require the presence of oxygen you may find uh, say methanogens so uh, bacteria that love methane okay so this is a general schematic showing some zones of, of lakes okay you're gonna see similar terms in the ocean okay so Neuston, that's surface, right here at the surface. So you might see protozoa, springtails, water spiders, water mites, water striders, and so on. Oftentimes, uh, lakes or oceanic, we do what's called a Neuston tow, which is a plankton net that floats right at the surface. You drag it along, and it collects a sample of whatever right at the surface. It's called a Neuston tow. Then you have... Um, the benthic zone, let's just start with the benthic zone is the substrate. Organisms that live within the substrate are called benthic organisms. If they're living on top of the substrate, 
So in others, they're in. So in others, there's water, right? They're right there in the water, but they're living, you know, like walking around on the substrate. Then we call them epibenthic, epi being on top. And so you have what's called a literal zone. A literal zone is basically open water over uh, shallow areas. In other words, shallows where you don't have to go too far down uh, for the depth, okay? As opposed to uh, a pelagic, which is more open water, and you and overlies, uh, you know, where the substrate is found very deep. So, the literal and pelagic zone are both open water areas. Okay, you can have, uh, you know, later you, we have what called neritic uh, areas, which is, uh, you know, very close to shore. That we use that in ocean term, but the literal zone. Uh, you know, the, the depth which you hit the substrate is not very deep. So example, literal benthos, you have hydra, uh, brycoates, leeches, uh, ostracods, true midgets, amphipods. Okay. Profundal zone, this is very deep zone. Sometimes it's in lakes, you could, this could be a hypoxic or anoxic region, depending on what goes on with the lake as far in terms of mixing. And profundo benthos, you have gastro, uh, gastrotrix, you have uh, flatworms, nematodes, oligochaetes, true midges. And in the literal water column, you get water mice, rotifers, uh, cladocera, water boatmen, phantom midges, pelagic zooplankton, protozoa, rotifers, cladocera, and copepods, phantom midges, right? You notice there's some similarities here because these are both considered open water areas. So this is just kind of orientate yourself, so I'll give you some of the classifications. And you'll see they got this little dash line here. That's supposed to be the transition from literal to pelagic, pelagic to literal location. And as you see, the pelagic is over the deeper area, the literal over uh, shallower areas. Okay. So this is the water surface. So now we have the literal zone. You can see in the literal zone, you might have some uh, vegetation growing into out of the substrate. Here's the aphotic zone and photic zone. I'll describe what that means in a moment. Right, so the pelagic zone, literal zone, again, over shallow regions, pelagic over deeper regions. So the photic zone is the depth which sunlight reaches. Right? Aphotic zone means the sunlight energy does not reach there. Right? Depending on the type of water body you're looking at, the photic zone can be very shallow especially if you have a eutrophic lake, or it can be deeper if you have an oligotrophic lake. And I'll explain those terms later on uh, in this presentation. The mixed layer, this is the surface layer. Typically, you usually have uniform temperature. We're assuming freshwater lake here. And the mixed layer is where water is mixed. Usually, you have winds blowing across the surface. That induces the mixing. This dashed line you see right at the bottom of the photic zone is the compensation depth. This is where the rates of photosynthesis from the primary producers equals the rate of respiration that the primary producers do. And so that's usually right at the bottom of the photic zone. The longer dashed line here is the approximate location of the thermocline depth. So let's say this might be, say, 20 degrees. C, okay, uniform throughout. And then you, you transition the thermocline and you might get to uh, say something that's like uh, 12 degrees C and may even get cooler. It may be gradually decreasing as you go down in depth, but you're going from like 20 to 12 over, you know, say you know, half a meter or so. Very sharp uh, change in a, st a very steep gradient over a very small distance. Okay. So because you have this thermocline, this is like a barrier. This is the, that prevents mixing from waters below from waters above. It mixes in the upper layers because it's all uniform. But this sharp change in thermocline or picnocline to density prevents, for the moment, this water from communicating with this water. The upper layers and the lower layers don't communicate. They will later on. And here we go. So there's going to be a series of such slides where I'm going to uh, go through all of this.
Usually the upper layer, this mixed layer, is called, referred to as the epilimnion. Now epi is upper, upper like uh, epipelag uh, epipelagic or epibenthic, right, above. Then you have this thermocline with this sharp change in temperature, in this case we're talking freshwater lake, then the hypolimnion. Sometimes you'll see the term metalimnion instead of thermocline, means the same thing. So what's going on here? We see 22, 20, we see some you know, warm temperatures up here. And then see 18 to 8, very, very drastic change in temperature over a small distance. And then it, it just gradually decreases as you go deeper and deeper. Now, where's the term limnion come from? Well, there's a branch of ecology called limnology. Limnology is basically the study of freshwater systems. Limnology is broken down into two major uh, groups. You have lentic, L-E-N-T-I-C, and lotic, L-O-T-I-C. Lentic is uh, usually referring to like streams and rivers, you no know, freshwater uh, systems where the freshwater is moving, you know, flowing, that kind of stuff. Lotic is referring to lakes and ponds and that kind of stuff. So, um, so, so limnion is derived from limnology, which is the term that's used uh, by for those ecologists to study freshwater systems. So this here is in summer, so it might be June, July. As we go into the fall, the autumn, it starts to cool down. So the upper water, and remember, this is warmer water. It is less dense than watered below it. So it's going to, quote unquote, float on top. Right? And the hypolimnion and the epilimnion, they will not communicate. They're not able to mix because of this thermocline, sharp change in temperature. So warmer water is uh, less dense than cooler water. But as it cools down, the surface water starts cooling down into autumn, it does what? It's getting more dense. So it starts to sink. And that's what this overturn here. And if you look, the temperatures are uniform, 4 degrees C. I'll explain the significance of 4 degrees C in a moment. So this is, so it starts cooling down, the surface water cooled down, becomes more dense, it starts sinking, and the whole water column overturns. It mixes. So now you don't have an epilimnion, you don't have a hypolimnion, it's all uniform. Now we move into winter, okay? So we're going in a clockwise manner around here. Now we're moving to winter, the water further cools down till we get to zero degrees C and we have an ice cover. And then we have two degrees and then four degrees C. Fresh water is at its most dense when it's four degrees C. Now there's the temperature at which the maximum density for fresh water occurs at is at four degrees uh, C, which is about 39.2 Fahrenheit. As the water further cools towards the freezing, it becomes less dense. This is due to the polar covalent uh, bonding nature of the hydrogen and uh, oxygen atoms. Basically, a, a covalent uh, a bond is a bond where pairs of electrons are shared between two atoms, usually shared equally. A polar covalent bond is the pairs of electrons are shared unequally. Oxygen, being a bigger atom than hydrogen, will be uh, will tend to it has a greater attraction. So the electron clouds, because electrons are not particles, they're like it's a, it's a cloud, it's a wave function. Tend uh, will the pairs will be, uh, you know, uh, basically associating closer to the oxygen atom than to the hydrogen atom. That creates a slight polar, what we call dipole moments, and this leads to hydrogen bonding, and this leads to basically a, a type of lattice structure so that as the water cools down, cools down, it, it expands. If it weren't for the fact that water expands upon freezing, all the oceans, all the freshwater lakes, uh, on the planet would be big frozen ice cubes. But that expansion of water due to the polar covalent bonding and the 
and the hydrogen bonds, uh, uh, aspects of, of water, very interesting uh, substance, allows for ice to float. Zero degrees, even one degree C, is less dense than four degrees C. So you get this ice cover. Now this ice cover, depending on the conditions in the lake, if there's no mixing of oxygen at the interface, because you know you have you have wind blowing across, as I mentioned earlier, it can mix in oxygen at the surface, which organisms that require oxygen and dissolves in the solution, it helps them. That ice cap may prevent the oxygen uh, from mixing into the water. And depending on the number of organisms, they could find their the level of oxygen decreasing that they suffocate and you get what's called a fish die off, you know, winter fish kill. You know, again, depends on the conditions found in this in the uh, lake under consideration, but that is often happens. So now what happens? We start getting into springtime, the ice starts absorbing the sun energy, it starts to melt. It's warming up, but as it warms up to four degrees C, it's becoming more dense. And then it's, it sinks and overturns the water column, mixing in the nutrients into the surface layer. As the water continues to warm up going into through late spring into early summer, you arrive back at, at this situation here where you then have your stratified water column. This is what I'll, I'll, I've got some terminology for you later, but this is typical for lakes found in temperate regions. And you see that there's two overturn uh, per, per year. We call that a dimictic. I'll have that later on. So this is the exact same. Okay. Winter is up here, however. And we see that we have zero, two. So there's a slight a stratification here not very pronounced we have the ice cover we have the overturn during the spring then we have the summer right epi uh, limnian thermocline hypolimnian and then followed by the fall turnover so exact same things here is no so i won't go through that again but what i want the reason why i included this slide is because i wanted to show you i mentioned earlier about oxygen i wanted to show you what's going on with the oxygen levels here Okay, so we have oxygen in the uh, concentration milligrams per liter, and we're going down the depth of the lake, so from zero to 24 uh, meters. And so this is the graph for, for winter. As you can see, uh, right near the ice surface, it, it's a little low, but it increases slightly into, into layers just below the ice, and then it drops. It dra drastically drops off to near zero at the bottom. This this is the neutrocline right here, right where it does this like elbow, this angle. That's the, let's see, not neutrocline, oxycline. That's the oxycline right there, which is probably occurring in this vicinity. And so we have high oxygen concentration, medium, and then low oxygen concentration for this color schemes. And if you're gonna have fish, you're gonna find them right in here the oxygen is highest and if this further goes if this starts to go down to zero at a much shallower depth you're going to get fish kill springtime when we have the water column mix you see that the there's no oxycline it's a uniform mixture go into summertime right water column is you see that it's less and then it's decreasing right this is this oxycline is uh, corresponding in essence to the thermocline, which can also be called the picmocline, and then it's decreasing all the way down to zero at the bottom. Remember, warmer, the warmer the water temperature is, the gas solubility decreases with warmer temperatures. And then when we get into the autumn, we can have uniform oxygen levels throughout. You also note that the oxygen level is higher in the autumn and in the spring at its lowest in the summertime because you get you prevent you have respiration using up the oxygen there's no mixing no communication with the water below and you start getting a stagnating layer here so yeah you can see a nice sharp oxycline there a little bit there 
So once again, I'm going to drive home the, the point of this mechanism. This is showing, uh, you know, as opposed to seeing, showing us several more panels, so we get a little more uh, finer uh, delineation of what's going on. So uh, let's start with uh, January. Let's start at the bottom here, and we'll go uh, clockwise. In January, the lake is ice covered. Temperature is zero C at the surface and four C at depth, gradually decreasing over. Okay, it's January. You know, and then you can take into account what I described before about what might be happening with the oxygen levels of organisms, that sort of thing. As we get into late winter, early spring, ice is melted by late March. Water temperatures are approximately uh, equal from top to bottom of the lake. So in the spring, the uniform temperatures throughout the water column facilitate a vertical mixing. Okay, first or second depends on your, where you started from. The point is you have a vertical mixing. Okay, that's going on. Then we start mid-April. Epilimnion has warmed to 10 degrees C, so we're starting to get the stratification and it's starting to form. So, so the thermal climb is forming in here. And then by late June, surface temperatures reach 28 degrees C. Temperature of the hypolimnion remains at about 4 C. And then here's that sharp change. So this is what about the right about there. That's your thermocline. Much warmer water temperature, and then you see the sharp change and get down into the metalimnion or the thermocline. Same thing. So then in October, we start cooling down. So the epilimnion starts cooling down. We're going to see the starting to break down this. And by the time we get into November, the thermocline is completely broken down and we have the overturn. So then you get your vertical, mix, uh, vertical mixing and you're back to here. So you can, just like uh, I showed you uh, the oxygen profile over depth, you can do a temperature profile over depth. And speaking of which, warm water epilimnion, rapid temperature change, thermocline, cold water hypolimnion. Right? There's your epilimnion right up here. There's your thermocline, almost looks like a cubic function, and then going into the hypolimnion. So there you have it. Stratification equals layers. Now, if we wanted to look at the temperature uh, profile in summertime, which is indicating in red, you have the epilimnion, pretty much the same, like a slight decrease, but pretty much the same. This is also a mixed layer. Then you see here's that rapid change. That's the thermocline. And then down into a pretty uniform hypolimnion. In winter, you have ice up here. Zero is still colder than four, but it's still less dense. So what happens here, instead of, you know, the in the summertime, the water cools down to the thermocline. In winter, the water warms up through the thermocline until you reach four degrees C. So now I want to look at... summer and winter stratification compared to an oligotrophic and a eutrophic lake. The situation for both lakes will be the same in spring and fall. So these two panels here referring to oligotrophic lakes, which are nutrient poor, and these two panels down here refer to eutrophic lakes, which are nutrient rich. So let's start with the spring turnover. We see uniform temperature, DO is dissolved oxygen, okay, that's milligrams of oxygen per liter. So we see uniform temperature, uniform oxygen content. As we go into the height of summer, okay, we see what? We see the temperature starts out warm in the epilimnion. There's your thermocline into the hypolimnion. The oxygen, we see a higher oxygen level in the hypolimnion. And... Here is the oxycline. Back to uniform conditions in the fall, and then in winter conditions, again, here's that little warming right below the ice to the, through the thermocline, and then pretty much uniform temperature through depth, and we see you know, a slight decrease in the oxygen level, but they're pretty much uniform through depth. Okay, And then you go back to uh, springtime. 
So now why is the oxygen level higher for oligotrophic? Because it's nutrient poor, even primary producers use oxygen, but also you get primary production taking place, then you're going, that's going to allow for heterotrophs to feed on the, on the primary producers, on the autotrophs, and then you're gonna have bigger heterotrophs, et cetera. They're gonna use up oxygen. If you don't have such productivity there, well, the oxygen is not being used up there. So the oxygen, we typically find higher oxygen levels in oligotrophic lakes. So now, okay, we, so looking at the eutrophic lakes here, okay, we, we've already talked about this. It's going to be the same situation spring and fall. What's happening in summer? Well, in summer, we still see a similar situation with the temperature profile. But look at the oxygen profile. Instead of increasing with depth, it decreases with depth. And here's an oxycline because you have a lot of organisms uh, just using up the oxygen for respiration purposes. That's why. And if it goes to zero, then that means this layer underneath where it goes to zero is probably hypoxic, if not anoxic water layers. We find that uh, eutrophic uh, lakes tend to be murky, so the visibility is not as great, but they tend to have hypoxic and anoxic layers because everything is used up. And we see something similar. So we see this similar temperature profile, but we see quickly, boom, the oxygen just is used up. And you will notice that this oxygen goes a little deeper. Okay, fine. Depending on the depth of the lake, you could have... And the same thing here in, in, in winter, spring, whatever, you could have dead zones. And then you could have, and if this oxygen profile were to go to zero or shallower depths, you're going to really increase the likelihood of winter fish kills. So we do this. And we do the same thing in the ocean. We take temperature profiles, salinity profiles, density profile, oxygen profile, uh, nitrate, nitrite profiles, etc. We do all these sort of profiles. I wanted to show you that. Okay. So uh, a little more detail here. Now with, now bringing in wind action. Epilimnion, we already know that's a surface layer of water that's constantly mixed by wind and waves, warmed by the sun, late spring to uh, uh, late fall, uh, typically uniform temperature depths. The metalimnion is the middle layer. That's the thermocline. It's characterized by steep gradient temperature, maybe density demarcated by the regions above the epilimnion and below the hypolimnion. So we're seeing the layering, stratification. <clears throat> the metalimnion slash thermocline is the barrier that prevents mixing and heat exchange between the epi and hypolimnion. Hypolimnion is the deepest layer of uniformly cold water that does not mix with the upper layers and has low circulation. The colder water within the hypolimnion is at its maximum density at a temperature of four degrees C. Because that's where water is its maximum density due to the structure of the water molecule. Thermal stratification is the seasonal uh, phenomenon that takes place <clears throat> that occurs from late spring to late fall, typically in temperate regions. In the summer, the upper layer, and they're using Great Lakes, is warmed significantly by the sun. By the sun. Cooler water separates, forming two additional layers, the epi and the meta, excuse me, the hypo and epi. Uh, okay, epilimnion epi is the upper layer, metalimnion, hypolimnion. They are heavier and denser. During the winter, when there's no stratification, lake cools, we get the overall temperature is more uniform. We get the vertical mixing of the water column. So circulation of freshwater lake, that's wind-induced. So here's the thermocline at dashed line. So we have the mixing of the upper layer, but there's no communication because it is thermocline with lower layers. In the autumn, the whole thing can communicate. Winter, you got wind blowing across the ice, ain't much going to happen. And then in the spring, mixing of the water column. That's wind activity. Okay, here are some definitions. An oligotrophic lake or warm uh, water body is one which has a relatively low productivity due to the low nutrient content in the lake. The waters of these lakes are usually quite clear due to limited growth of algae in the lake. The waters of such lakes are of high drinking quality. Such lakes support aquatic species who require 
well oxygenated cold water such as trout. Oligotrophic lakes are usually found in the cold regions of the world where mixing of nutrients is rare and slow due to the low temperatures of the lake waters. Mesotrophic lakes with an intermediate level productivity. These lakes have medium level nutrients are usually clear water with submerged aquatic plants. Usually growing out of substrate, for example. Eutrophic lakes. Lakes that are eutrophic in nature have high levels of biological productivity, nutrient rich, abundance of plants is supported by such lakes due to rich nutrient constitution, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. Initially, eutrophic lakes accelerate multiplication and growth of lake fauna due to the high levels of oxygen provided by the plants, large number of plants. However, when things cross the limits and plants of algae bottoms overcrowd the lake, the lake fauna suffers due to high levels of respiration by the vegetative matter. Plants do respire. When they're not photosynthesizing, they're respiring. They're taking in oxygen, it's usually at night, to and then live off the, you know, the glucose they've made during the day. So plants do respire. So you got a lot of plants, but then you have all these organisms, and then they're using up the oxygen. And if you got stratification, they're going to use up the oxygen within the stratification, and then you know the productivity stops. The you know it's, it's productivity by mean that the secondary productivity, which is the productivity resulting from heterotrophic activity. Primary productivity is the productivity which is adding biomass that is done by the autotrophs, the photosynthesizers. Secondary productivity is the biomass added by heterotrophs eating the autotrophs, grazing upon them. So often oxygen is nearly or totally depleted. Eutrophication might occur naturally, or if you have humans dumping in a pile of sewage that's full of phosphates and nitrates, like detergents. Hypereutrophic, these lakes suffer from problems arising due to excessive plant and algal growth due to a high supply of growth nutrients. These lakes have little transparency due to the dense overgrowth of algae or aquatic flora. These lakes usually have visibility limited to lower than less than a meter. Hypereutrophic uh, lakes also have more than 100 micrograms per liter of phosphorus and more than 40 micrograms per liter of total chlorophyll. The overgrowth of algae often suffocates the fauna below the water depths, and this creates dead zones, hypoxic, low oxygen, or anoxic, no oxygen layers beneath the water surface. And if you have humans adding pollutants, increases the problem. So there's some of those definitions I uh, mentioned earlier. Now let's talk about the types of mixing that we have. Hollow mictic lakes, lakes are where the entire water column from surface to the deep layers and mix complete overturn of the entire water column miromictic lakes are lakes where there's incomplete mixing of the water column such that the deep layers are not mixed so you might have a water uh, layer let's uh, kind of zoom up here but let's say okay you have something like this the water column might only mix say the upper 60 to 70 meters but the bottom you know, 30 meters or so is not mixed. So if the if it depth only reaches to here, this layer is not mixed. Okay? That'd be an example of miromictic. Holomictic, it goes from top all the way to bottom and so forth. So miromictic is an incomplete mixing of the water layers. So the deep layers are not mixed. Such lakes develop dead zones that are anoxic at deep depths due to no oxygen or nutrients found. Diamictic lakes, there are two turnovers of the water column per year, typical in temperate latitudes. The examples and the slides we've been discussing thus far with the fall and spring turnovers are diamictic lakes. Monomictic lakes are lakes where there's just one turnover of the water column every year. Now you can have a combination of these classifications. For example, you could have a holomictic monomictic lake. In other words, you have a lake that has one turnover of the year but when it does turn over, the entire water column is mixed over. Or you can have a miromictic dimictic lake where there's two turnovers a year, but they're incomplete mixing. The entire water column does not mix. And then finally, we have amictic lakes that never mix at all during a year. Typically found at high latitudes, such lakes tend to be permanently covered by ice. Now, a word about the mixing. This refers to a homogenization, right? Homogenization of the water column 
So the term amictic is not meant to imply the what that the lake itself, the lake water itself is stagnant. There may be internal processes such little seepage from the substrate or seepages from groundwater, what have you. But we're not having, say, uh, density driven, you know, uh, major density driven uh, circulation. When we look at vertical mixing, right, with the, you know, let's say the, the water column cooling down, warming up, whatever, these are density driven circulation vertical circulations are density driven now yes there may be uh wind activity right wind action may help facilitate mixing the water column in addition to the density current but when we're talking about mixing which are usually talking about density driven uh situations and you get a homogenization of the water column But again, speaking, that productivity in water systems, both fresh and salt, there are two major steps. First is to have a thorough vertical mixing of the water column that goes well below the photic zone. This stirs up nutrients, spreads the concentration throughout the water column, as well as in horizontal directions. Second, a stabilization of the water column, which is achieved when stratification appears. This creates the layers in the water column where upper and lower layers cannot communicate with each other due to the presence of thermocline, halocline, picnocline, right? Usually the depth where the stratification starts is typically at the bottom of the photic zone, but this can vary, especially in oceanic system. Now, during this period, the upper layer, say the epilimnion, can mix uh, throughout. You might have wind activity. But what it does is it locks the nutrients into the upper layers of the water within the photic zone which the phytoplankton then utilize, and they're in the photic zone, so you have primary production taking place. Primary production will continue until the nutrients are used up. Then things cool down, and you have the breakdown, so on and so forth. Another reason why you don't have a lot of productivity during uh, the vertical mixing periods, like in the fall and the spring, especially in the autumn, is that oftentimes the uh, autotrophs are mixed out of the photic zone, so they can't photosynthesize. Okay, so now we're going to go on to salt water here. All right. <clears throat> the density of salt water, open wa uh, ocean, near shore, coastal waters, estuarine, brackish waters, etc., is now a function of two variables temperature and salinity, which is the salt content measured in parts per thousand. So we still have our friend Rho which is the symbol for density. But now we see that rho is a function of temperature and salinity, capital S for salinity. Small case S would be seconds. So capital S is salinity. If we want to know the rate of change of density with respect to temperature, we state d rho dt. Now, you might remember earlier I had a small case letter d here. So you're going to say, what is this funky looking, looks like a backward six. That's the symbol we use to indicate a partial derivative. In other words, when I see this symbol used in this derivative, that tells me that the density of water with respect to temperature is only part of the story because I know now that there is another independent variable. So temperature and salinity are two independent variables. So if I zoom all the way up to there, right? See, small case d. This tells me, and we'll look at this one here. This tells me that density only depends on temperature. All the way down to here. And this is telling me that density depends on temperature, but there is another variable involved. In other words, it does not only depend on temperature, but also depends on salinity. So the rate of change of density with respect to salinity is stated as d rho ds. We read it the same way, rate of change in, in density with respect to the rate of change in temperature, rate of change in density with respect to rate of change in, in salinity. But we call them partial derivatives because if we want to know the total change in density, now you see the symbol. We've got a, a, a more familiar small case d here. d rho simply is equal to, basically you add up the two partial derivatives. 
That's why they call partials, part of the total. Again, this is what we do when we want to calculate such things, when we want to create vertical profiles, we're doing all this stuff here. We see, you know, if the rate of change, if we have an, a uniform upper uh, epilimnion, the rate of change of density with respect to temperature is zero. We have uniform temperature. But when you go through the thermocline, now we're seeing a rate of change. That's not zero. Salt water density will decrease with an increase in temperature and vice versa. So it will, so you increase the temperature, the density decreases. Decrease the temperature, density increases. And what we're assuming is that we're holding salinity uh, level constant. So if I've got, uh, say, 28 degrees uh, C, C uh, temperature and the salinity is 32 parts, and I've got uh, 30 degrees C uh, temperature with 32 uh, parts salinity, the 30 degree uh, water will be less dense because it has a warmer temperature. The 28 will be uh, more dense because that's a cooler temperature. We're holding salinity constant. And by the way, one of the assumptions when, when we do these things, when we take the rate of uh, change with respect to rho with respect to temperature, we are holding salinity constant. Vice versa here, we hold the temperature constant. That's the, in some ways, it makes uh, multivariate uh, derivatives easier. It's like, okay, you know, uh, the rate of change of uh, density. Density depends on temperature salinity. All right, we hold uh, salinity constant, look at the change with respect to temperature. Hold temperature constant, look at the rate of change with respect to salinity. That's what we're doing. Salt water density will increase with an increase in salinity, decrease with a decrease in salinity. We again, hold temperature constant. So which is more dense? Cold, less saline water or warm, more saline water? Ho, ho, ho. It is not straightforward. Depends on the exact temperature, the exact salinity. Subtle changes leads to numerous mixing regimes, both vertically and horizontally and is a major driver of oceanic water movement, aside from winds, geostrophic flows, and so on. And I say, please see my rotating systems video where I explain all of this. So when you've got cold, less saline water mixing with warm, uh, more saline water, such as the Atlantic water moving into the Arctic Ocean kind of stuff, okay, you're gonna get all these little types of mixing. You're gonna get vertical mixing, you're gonna get horizontal mixing, and so forth. It becomes extremely complex, but believe it or not, even these subtle changes can create density current, can create vertical movement and horizontal movement, but you get the vertical movements, you're going to get, you got it, mixing in the vertical manner. When you have two water masses meeting in the ocean, these subtle differences in temperature and salinity will determine how the mixing proceeds and thus how the water movement ensues. Surface processes, such as when the water evaporates off the surface or precipitation is added to the surface, such as what we see in the tropics, or when ice melt water is added, sea ice melts or sea water freezes to form sea ice, such as the polar region, also drive density currents. Generally speaking, generally speaking, in tropical water, salinity content tends to be about the same. So changes in the temperature tends to be the driving factor in determining the density of oceanic waters. Yeah, there may be a lot of evaporation, but it's off the surface. But then usually it happens in the tropics, you get a lot of evaporation, then you get a lot of thunderstorms later on, like the same day. So you don't really get a lot of change in the moisture content. But some of that evaporation will form clouds that will then that the winds may carry away. So at the local region, you're going to have a you know increase. Uh, salinity because you pulled out some of the water. So you're going to get, you know, you know, it's, it's driven by changes in temperature, but you still get, might get a little bit of a vertical mixing. Later on, it, you know, if you have an excess of precipitation dumped somewhat further, you're going to be adding this fresher water to the surface layer. So you might be inhibiting any slight changes in vertical mixing. And of course, this is dependent on the time of year. 
So, but overall, the salinity really is not affected that greatly in the tropics. However, there's more direct solar irradiance energy input into the system with the cooling off at night that will heat up the upper layers, the photic zone. This, of course, varies greatly with cloud cover storms, etc. These changes in temperature tend to drive density differences and changes. And depending on the exact density values will determine how, how deep the vertical mixing, if any, occurs. Usually when water sinks, there's also what's called buoyant forces. So it will sink because it's, it's denser until it reaches a, a layer that has a similar density. And so then the buoyant forces hold, you know, it stops the sinking at that level. I'll talk more about that later. In high latitudes, polar regions, the oceanic water temperatures tend to be similar throughout with very cold temperatures. Changes in salinity is the main driving factor. This is where you're gonna see the halo climbs, for example. So you will probably, you will see thermoclines in the tropics more so. You'll see halo-clines in the polar region. And, but of course, those since density is dependent on salinity and temperature, there's also going to be changes in the pycnocline. There tends to be more precipitation at high latitudes than in the tropical region. You're going to have snow, ice melt, riverine input, all which dilute and changes the salt content, changing the density. Now the math gets a little fun. We can have such we can find such changes in vertical or horizontal directions with or with respect to time. The math becomes a bit more complicated involving what's called a gradient operator. This little uh, triangular symbol with the point down is called a del operator. Okay, uh, lengthy chain in the involving well, lengthy chain rules, etc. I'm writing here generalities here. I could substitute specific uh, general derivatives here, and you can end up something that will become extremely lengthy and which is a load of fun to play with. So the following is the rate of change in density over time. So it's based on changes in temperature and salinity, hence the need for two chains. One chain, excuse me, and the second chain. So here are your two chains, the first one and the second one, which you notice partial derivatives you summing them up overall. So we're saying that the total change in density with respect to time is dependent on the rate of change of density with respect to temperature times the rate of change of temperature with respect to uh, time, plus the rate of change in density with respect to salinity times the rate of change in salinity with respect to time. Notice that I use the partial symbol here because density depends on temperature and salinity. I use the total derivative here because where density is only depending on time. Likewise, for temperature and salinity, they only depend on time, so I use the total derivative there. So uh, when I used to teach the Calc 3, I was extremely strict with my students to make sure they were, they were precise with the, with the notational use, because it means if I write D rho D capital T, that means something different than this D rho DT. So it, it communicates a very precise thing. So I was always uh, very strict on that. So the first equation, that's a, this equation here, okay? So this is separate from the previous one here. This just gives me a chain to calculate the change of, temp of density with respect to time. I have to take into account temperature and salinity changes. Okay. So if I write del rho, this is the change of density with respect to the x direction, respect to the y direction, and the z direction. x and y are the horizontal direction. z is the vertical direction. i, j, k, which boldface, tells me these are vectors. Knows it's giving me a direction. Vectors are uh, quantities that have a magnitude and a direction. So it's telling me which way stuff is going. Now the second equation is how density changes in one particular horizontal direction. So d rho dx. Now I have the partials here because the density could change with respect to x, y, z. d rho dt 
time. Now we notice again the partial because temperature can also change with respect to X, Y, Z. Salinity can change with respect to X, Y, Z. And I could do the same thing for the Y and Z direction. I could do rho dy. Where are you going here? Right. D rho dy. Okay. D rho dt times dt dy. D rho dx times ds dy. D rho dz. Put a z there, z there. And then you, you would take all these three things here, right? If you take this one here, shove it in there. Take uh, d rho dt, dt dy, and, and ds dy, right? Take that, shove it in there. D rho dt, dt dz, d rho ds, ds dz. Take that, shove it in there, and you get your total gradient changes in density. And we do this, folks. This is how we calculate uh, density across the oceans. This is what we do. When we create the temperature salinity, uh, what we call TS diagram, or when we're looking at you know, whatever we're doing, this is, this is what we're doing. I just want to give you a flavor of that. Now, what does the Dell operator itself? It is a shorthand for what we see here. DDX times the I vector, DDY, J vector, DDZ. And then you substitute, you know, the previous example, I should put a row here. But I could, uh, if I want to look at the change in the uh, oxygen level, okay, put the, put the oxygen variable in there. So the Dell operator defines a gradient. Gradient informs us of the sharpest, highest, and absolute value term. Rate of change could be up or down, increase or decrease, in a specified direction. Typically, the direction will be perpendicular to the contour lines. For example, when winds blow, they move from high to low pressure areas. They move down the gradient across the isobars. And we have Coriolis acting on us to create the rotating system. Again, watch my rotating system video. So to give you an example of what I'm meaning here, okay? This is a water level contour map showing an elevation of the upper surface of saturated zone. Notice the water table. Groundwater flows down the gradient at right angles to the contour. Okay, so, so we see these, like, little, these dashed lines here, okay? Those are whatever the levels are, okay? So... Contours at 25 foot intervals. So, um, we can give you the scale in miles. So, water level. So, we've got to say uh, this might be, let's see, since the same mile, so this might be, say, 200 feet, 175, 350 feet. So, these are like uh, increments in 25 foot levels. So, this is high ground, right? And what do we see here? These Solid lines with the arrows, that's indicating the direction. This is water flowing down the contours. As you can see, it's flowing basically perpendicular to the contour lines here. And we see another direction of groundwater flow this way. So this would be you know water below the level, but it's you know high groundwater to low groundwater, maybe going to a river floodplain, maybe going to the ocean. This is a groundwater divide, meaning that on one side, the water flows to the ocean, the other side, it goes to a lake or a plain or a floodplain, what have you. But the point I want to show you here is that the flow is perpendicular to the contour lines. As you see here, this is one direction. This is another direction. So if we wanted to calculate the rate of change, we, we would have a vector valued function that tells us, okay, the rate of change is this amount in given this vector. And you're going to have, you know, an IJK. So you're going to have an XYZ coordinate. So the Z coordinate might be, say, you know, 200 here, It'd be zero down here. And, you know, depending where you place your origin, but you could have, you know, say something like, uh, I don't know, 2I, uh, 2J, uh, 200k, something like that. But you can then, the direction tells you, the, the direction is given to you by the vectors. And then we can calculate the rate of change in a specified direction as defined by the given vector values. Well, that makes sense. But 
this is showing movement perpendicular to the contour lines. That's one different vector. That's another different vector. The vectors define the direction of motion is what it is. And we call these vector valued functions. So when you look at your IJK, think of your 3D coordinate system, your X, Y, Z axes, and you can then plot it. So if I have a uh, two I three J four uh, K, okay, start from the origin and go, you know, two units along the X axis, uh, three units along the Y axis, four units up the Z axis, and then you create a point in space where those uh, intersect, and then you draw a vector from the origin to that point defined by two, three, four. That's what we do. We have we have specific methods to calculate that. I'm not going to bore you with that. But when you have a, a vector, functions define a direction of movement. We can then calculate the rate of change in that direction. So this is going to be one vector function. This is a completely different vector function. Okay, so let's now look at oceanic divisions. Okay. So what we see here is a high tide mark, low tide mark. Okay. This is called the littoral zone. That's in between high tide and low tide levels. So organisms that live here have to adapt to being uh, covered in water, have to adapt to being exposed in air. So they're very adaptive uh, uh, species. This is the neuritic zone, which usually corresponds to the uh, littoral zone. So, but well, we use the littoral more for freshwater systems, but you can use it for, for uh, oceanic systems. But uh, we tend to use neuritic for uh, uh, open water over a shelf, right? This is a shelf where we have a gradual decrease in depth. And then when you get to boom, so this is going down the continental sh uh, shelf, then we go down the continental slope where it really drops off. And then we get into what's called the pelagic zone. Okay. Well, the pelagic zone is the neuritic and the oceanic. So the oceanic is over basically the slope and the deep portions. Neuritic is over the shelf. Be close to shore or far from shore. Okay. Sublittoral or shelf. Okay. So sublittoral will always be covered by water. This dashed line here, you can see, is the photic zone. Really, in the ocean, sunlight doesn't reach too far down. Depending where you're at, you know, if, if it reaches 100 meters, it reaches a lot. So open water is pelagic. Neuritic is over the shelf. Oceanic is over the slope, basically. And they're giving you some temperature regimes, okay? So you have the epipelagic, which is the upper open ocean. Mesopelagic, middle layer. Then we get into... Bathy pelagic, abyssal pelagic, and hadal pelagic. This is when you really get into deep stuff here. And as you can see, once you get out of the photic zone, it's all aphotic. So any organisms down here are going to rely on marine snow detritus that falls, you know, dead organisms on the surface. Unless you add a hydrothermal vent, we have chemosynthesis going on here. You're not going to find many primary produ uh, producers here once you get out of the photic zone. Any primary producers are basically utilizing chemosynthesis, chemical energy. So this is showing you basically some of the oceanic division. Neuritic oceanic equals pelagic, open water. Oh, let's look at some of the stuff that uh, is affecting things. We have terrestrial radiation, um, biomass. So looking at... Uh, the, the red arrows are indicating a movement of solar energy. So this is incoming. This is outgoing. Okay. Maybe some, uh, deep, when you deep, uh, cut down forests, your uh, energy is released into the atmosphere. Uh, you have the atmosphere ice coupling. In other words, when you form ice crystals, uh, in cloud, ice sheets, snow, right? All that kind of stuff here. Atmospheric pollutants may be absorbed. You have sea ice, ice ocean coupling with the interaction between the ice and the water. You have heat exchange through the air water interface, maybe some precipitation, okay. solar radi radiation coming in, maybe some of this reflected back into the space off the top of the clouds. 
right? Ocean atmosphere coupling, all these things, very complicated. Maybe some evaporation, wind stress. Now this arrow is indicating the wind is blowing this way. These shortening black arrows, that is creating what's called Ekman spiral. If you wanna know what Ekman spiral is, watch my rotating systems video there. It's a detailed explanation. I don't wanna get into that here, but, but it's explained in there. So then you're gonna have some ocean circulation, uh, you might find plankton, all the evaporation, precipitation, ice melting, ice freezing, this is all going to change the density and it's going to influence vertical movement. You get vertical movement, you're going to get mixing. So let's now look at a generalized cross section from the tropics to the polar areas. In the tropics, you get a upper mixed layer. Okay. It's wet, well deformed during the summertime, but it's pretty much typically present, especially in the tropic regions, year round. In other words, so you're going to get this main thermocline, okay, and you notice it's down about a thousand meters. There's typically what's called a permanent thermocline, the per but the permanent thermocline will surface as you get to the polar regions, such that you don't have a, per a permanent. Uh, picnocline. Now, the same thermocline, I'm going to use the term picnocline because it's really more density. But when in the tropical ocean, because of the it, the upper layers in the photic zone for most of the year really heated up, you have almost a, you have like a thermocline that, now I will say thermocline there, you have a thermocline that really inhibits, prevents mixing from water below the photic zone. Another reason why the middle of the oceans, in addition to having convergent zones in the gyrus, but you just don't have mixing of the nutrients in upper layers. Another reason why open oceans are biologically uh, low productivity. So this main picnocline is you get a permanent picnocline about a thousand to fifteen hundred meters down. Then you have deep water below it. But because it surfaces. If, if you have deep water formation forming at the polar region, it can sink to lower depths. You don't get that too much in the tropical regions. So this is where you're going to have what's called ventilation or mixing of the entire oceanic water column. It starts in the polar area. I'll talk about this later on. But if you cut off or slow down deep water formation, you slow that whole mixing regime right down. So here's your permanent uh, picnocline slash thermocline, you know, mid latitudes. As you see, it's not a layer, but keeps getting deeper and deeper because it's a function of the temperature and the salinity regime. You're having what's called a uh, water mass. You could have, for example, the North Atlantic deep water, North Atlantic intermediate water. You could have the Pacific uh, surface water. Uh, the Antarctic bottom water, all these, uh, and they're usually these different water masses are defined by a temperature salinity regime. So now you have a seasonal thermocline that we typically see, uh, especially in the tropics. You know, in, it's here in the summertime, it's a little more pronounced. But in the tropics, it's warmer temperature, it goes a little deeper, and it's it lasts further. Okay. So this might be, say, temperate latitudes. And then you get to high latitudes, and you're basically going to have uniform conditions. In fact, that's what this, this vertical dark line is showing uniform conditions for temperature at high latitudes. As you start moving away from high latitudes to temperate, then the temperature starts to uh, get a little warmer along with the salinity and water masses, you start defining a moving uh, picnocline that gets shallower and shallower. Then in the summertime, it, the picnocline moves this way. But if you're in the tropics, it starts deeper and moves further out because water, you know, this moving out, this is a warmer water temperature. So, Another way to look at this is that we're also looking at latitude going this way. So how warm it gets is a function of the latitude. Near the equator, it, the water temperature is going to get warmer. 
mid latitudes, 30, 40 degrees, it's not going to get as warm. So hence, the, the change in the temperature will occur at lower temperatures and will be shallower. It's deeper in the tropics. And then you get it really close, especially in wintertime, then it just shoots right up to the surface. So this is showing, as you're going from temperate zone to high latitude, the temperature getting cooler and cooler and cooler until it reaches the uniform temperature that we see at high latitude, and then it's uniform all the way to depth. And this is the permanent uh, pickup line. Starting from here, we get the seasonal changes. If that makes sense. Winter ocean temperatures, fairly uniform, okay? Distance from the coast, okay? Summer ocean temp uh, temperatures, thermal client slash picnic client. If you look at this, you see that it is not a horizontal, but it is a slight uh, uh, decline getting deeper in depth. And uh, so this is the depth. So this is 10 meters below the surface. We take you know, Z to be, the surface to be zero. It's going way down to say 100 meters and distance from the coast. So you get this summer ocean temperatures. This would be typical for the tropics. And if you have very shallow, yeah, then again, you can warm up the shallow down to the uh, substrate. Now let's look at the horizontal distribution of salinity. A couple of things that should strike you here. You'll see that we have a high concentration in the middle of this gyra. This is a gyra. This is another gyra. Another gyra, another gyra. The Mediterranean and the Red Sea have very high salinities. So now if you look overall, the Atlantic is more saline than the Pacific. Why is that? It tends to be more evaporation uh, on the Atlantic side. It tends to be more precipitation on the Pacific side, diluting the water. Also, you, uh, you're you going to have, a, a, this from we're looking at from a volume of water consideration, there's more riverine inputs on the Pacific side than on the Atlantic side. Even though you've got, you know, well, the Mississippi's in the Gulf, but you have the Chesapeake, Right, then you got the Amazon here. This is kind of like the Amazon right there. But overall, uh, the Atlantic tends to be more saline than the Pacific by about two, three parts per thousand on average. Notice how it's less saline at high latitudes. There's a lot of uh, snow, a lot of uh, riverine inputs. There's a lot of uh, glacial melt. This, of course, affects the density. So just, you know, as I talked about up here, you know, the temperature affecting the density, right? You know, from the perma uh, permanent thermal uh, picnocline slash thermocline, uh, getting shallower and shallower up to the surface here in autumn, but branching off in the summertime due to heating, branching off earlier in the tropics, or, or branching off early by that, I mean, you know, deeper depths, but it's uniform at high latitudes. So let's look at what happens from the pole to the equator. So we have heat loss from the ocean. That will make the water temperature colder. Colder water sinks, right? You see that this is more dense. This is dense water, less dense. Warm water moves polewards, like for example, the Atlantic water. You have water inputting heat input into the ocean. That warms up the surface water, makes it less dense, it'll float. But then when you've got currents and geostrophic flows and gyras, warm water will move to the poles. It will give off its heat, cool, and sink down, right? And then it travels southward. And eventually, it will warm up and rise again. So the driver of the what's called the thermal hailing circulation to get that deep water mixing it starts in the poles, it never starts in the tropics. It starts in the poles. We have water cooling down, but it has, it's cold, it's, you know, and it will sink. 
Now, if you have the warm water, okay, it has a higher salinity content, but as it cools down, it's now cold, salty water, which facilitates its sinking. Okay, heat loss from the ocean. Okay, you form the sea ice here. So now you're leaving behind water that has higher uh, salinity because you formed the ice. That will also drive the sinking. And that's this close to the substrate sinking that you see here. This is the cold water sinking due to the increased salinity from the ice freezing. This sinking in the middle blue shaded area is from the warm water giving off its heat so that it's not quite as cold, but it's still warm and salty, so it sinks. And then as the water is flowing, there's friction between the water masses. Friction imparts a little bit of heat, so you can get a little bit of warming of the water, so you can start getting some little uh, vertical uh, movements. We'll go from the pole to the equator. So again, this is showing the same thing here. Newly formed ice, salt is released, increases uh, the density. So dense of salty water sinks, boom, right here. Now you're going into through the Arctic halocline. You got maybe multi-year pack ice. You got cold fresh water here, or it's a colder, cold fresher water. Then you have cold saltier water, okay? And then it sinks, but now you have warm salty Atlantic water. The density regimes are such that even though this is salty water and it's cold it is less dense than this warm more salty atlantic water so this is where it's sinking to it finds it's a similar density regime then we have buoyant forces that keeps the water at that level so it will sink until it finds a similar density regime based on temperature and salinity it gets very complicated and not only is it vertically sinking, there's going to be horizontal mixing, vertical mixing, all that kind of stuff here. But this is what drives what we call a thermohaline circulation. Thermal temperature, haline salt. So vertical movements in the ocean are thermohaline uh, uh, currents and flows. We're looking at again here with the red is indicating the temperature regimes the green is the salinity and we're going from 33 to 35 now that is not a wide range that's only two parts per thousand but it is sufficient to to drive density currents and drive vertical currents so we have here freezing and brine release okay so we're adding salt into the system and it slides down here Go into the cold halocline layer. We have a low salinity surface mix layer. In other words, we have the, the water has not yet frozen. So it's going to be less saline here. And then it starts, and then we look at the uh this the salinity regime. Okay, it's vert, it's uniform through the mix layer. That's typical for mixed layers. You're going to have uniform temperature, salinity, what have you. Then it goes through the halocline, and then it becomes. Uh, more uniform as we enter the Atlantic water. So you see here, you look at these combined here. Okay, here's uniform temperature down through the layer of the cold halocline, halocline, and then it warms up. So the Atlantic water is warmer, but it's also saltier. That combination makes this more dense, so it's going to be below. Even though you have colder water here, it's less saline so it's going to float on top and the surface layer okay now we're holding the temperature constant but this is even less salty than in the halo climb so that floats on top of that so i think that explains that diagram shows a little better what i was trying to show here you know you have you know the cold but less saline waters here cold but salty water here then we get to the warm but very salty water here and it's sinking down through as the ice is forming so on so this coming even though it's warmer so you think oh warmer water be uh, less dense but it's saltier so this is a situation where the salt is determining the density more so than temperature okay but it's maybe colder but it's less saline not as dense 
And obviously, if I'm holding temperature constant, then this having the lowest salinity will be the least dense water. So I think that should be fairly uh, obvious as to why that sits on top. This big arrow here is showing that you have brine rejection, so you're increasing the salinity and thus the density. So it's, it's cold, but it's sinking down below this upper mixed layer. And then here's the Atlantic water meeting up. The blue lines are isopycnals. Those are the lines of the same density. So why does it go vertical? Well, that could be some uh, upwelling that will bring nutrients from below, especially from here. That will then, if you get some surface, uh, you get some mixing in the, in the uh, within the photic zone, then if you get a stratification, that allows for productivity to take place. The squiggly red lines are heat loss. So this is showing self-convection and cascading, cascading down. So here's that, uh, you know, uh, brine rejection, the cold water sinking. It may sink to this layer or some of it may sink to this layer, depending on its, on its uh, gravitational and buoyancy forces, which is uh, reflecting its uh, density. So you might find some vertical mixing what's called open ocean convection. So the formation of sea ice creates a vertical mixing due to brine rejection, which increases the density at the surface. I'm trying to sum up what the last few slides showed. Thus, it sinks being more dense. In spring and summer, the sea ice melts, adding fresh water to the surface, which creates surface waters less dense. We get a mini stratification, which is important because you then trap nutrients there and this little stratification leads to productivity, which when you calculate over the extent of the sea ice area is quite substantive and a very important part of the food web in the Arctic. This is called ice edge productivity. I, if you did not watch my video on, on ice algae, I discussed that there as well. Please look at that video. With loss of sea ice, this ice edge productivity is decreasing, putting in jeopardy this food web system. Freshwater input from melting glaciers would help stabilize surface waters, but without a prior mixing to the surface water, productivity is severely constrained. So the time of year this freshwater input occurs will impact this process. So in other words, we're, the more and more of the glaciers are melting. So you're adding this fresh water first, but if you're doing that before you have a chance for the nutrients to mix into the upper layers, you're not going to get the productivity. And also, if the sea ice melts earlier and it hasn't had a chance for the nutrients to be mixed into the upper layers, you're going to severely hamper productivity. So it's uh, so ice edge productivity is decreasing, and this is and the timing of when it occurs as well as you know input of fresh water is affecting this whole uh, basically food web system because if we have less and less sea ice you're not going to get that little uh you know, especially when you're away from riverine influences you are not going to get that freshwater layer that creates this little stratification so you're going to have to rely more on the pelagic phytoplankton but the pelagic phytoplankton won't start their productivity until the sun is at a high enough angle to initiate productivity so in other words that will occur later in the season and not last as long also decreasing overall productivity so it's so basically what's happening in the arctic region is severely hampering productivity up there which will affect you know, you know pollock production salmon production which are in, uh, commercially important uh, fish species so now let's take all this generalization and talk about amok so the upper is the North Atlantic Ocean circulation today, okay? So here's, so you got all this uh, flow here to the north, right? Here's the Gulf Stream, okay? There's, uh, so it's, there's Florida, okay? So it moves up north, okay? The uh, arrow, okay, this is, a, this is very warm, very uh, uh, strong flow here. The black arrows indicate uh, the strength of the flow, which is considerable. It gets up into the Gin Sea region here. The ocean releases large amounts of heat to the atmosphere because it's cooling down. Well, it's already salty to begin with. 
So now it becomes cold and salty. So the ocean water cooled, becoming denser and forms sinks to form the powerful deep southward current. That's what's going on here. This is the Gin Sea. This is where the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation begins. This is the sinking. This is the colloquially called the conveyor belt. It sinks and starts to flow south again. But notice that you see how it's, it doesn't go all the way down to depth. It goes down to a certain level because it sinks to where it finds similar density characteristics. And now you, so it sinks due to gravitational forces, but now it's held at that, whatever the depth is, by a thousand meters or so, due to buoyancy forces from similar, gravi uh, similar density regime from below. So it sinks all the way down. And eventually you get down to the Antarctic where through friction from encountering other water masses, it slightly warms up and it starts to upwell, those flow vertically upwards. And then in the Antarctic diversion zone, it brings the nutrients to the surface, phytoplankton do their thing. And that's why the, the Southern Ocean is the most productive open ocean area on the planet. So this is what's happening today. North Atlantic open ocean circulation about 20,000 years ago, peak of the last ice age. First of all, you'll notice that it's not as warm. This red indicates how warm the Gulf Stream is. It's very warm water. You notice that the arrows are shorter, so this flow is slower. Okay, Less heat is released to the atmosphere. The water, if, if it sinks, will sink to intermediate depths and spreads without filling the deep Atlantic. See, it. look at the, uh, the thickness of the arrows. This fills the Atlantic. This is called North Atlantic deep water. Here we're getting more intermediate water. Doesn't go f as far south. So waters from the south fill more of the deep Atlantic, where waters from the north fill more of the deep Atlantic, especially in the southern hemisphere. So you're not going to get this upwelling. You're not going to have that product, Southern Ocean productivity. And this is happening today. This rate of sinking is, is less and less. The AMOC is slowing down and may shut down. Another important feature when you have this Deep water for formation is it ventilates the ocean. In other words, it is a big vertical mixing machine driven by thermal hailing currents. Here we don't get the mixing. So you're going to start seeing lower oxygen levels at deeper waters. You're already going to get them in the hadal zone, okay? But in the intermediate to upper deep layers, you're not going to get that the mixing. And we see this in the ice cores and the sediment cores. We can tell you when there was you know, vertical water formation and when there was not. We can tell you when the deep water, the AMOC, the thermal hailing circulation was running and active. And we can tell you when it was shut down. We can tell you all of that. So here, Atlantic Ocean Thermal Hailing Circulation. We have the surface water, so we're going from the equator to north, south pole. Okay. AABW, Antarctic uh, bottom water. NADW, North Atlantic deep water. Then you have the intermediate water and surface water. In the, uh, in the equator, you know, between the 30s here, the surface water pretty much going to stay there. So you're not so think of this as sort of like a picnocline. You're not going to get much communication in the tropics and mid latitudes between surface water and intermediate water. The vertical mixing occurs at the high polar latitude, where you get the thermal hailing circulation that sinks vertically. So it, you know water continuity, uh, the volume, right? If it's sinking somewhere, it's got to move else. It's got to move up somewhere else. So you're going to get this big vertical mixing eventually, and the North Atlantic deep water will flow from the north, northern latitude, down to the south. You see how it's starting to, it's going to start inching up. This is the upwelling. Vertical mixing, bringing in nutrients. More complicated 
but the same idea that we discussed for freshwater system. You're going to have uh, very salty cold water coming off of uh, Antarctica that sinks. That's the Antarctic deep water. And then you have a bit of a mixing regime where it meets the NADW. Uh, so in the blue water, you're going to have increased nutrients, dissolved CO2. Moment on that. Uh, warm water, in the red, low nutrients. It's oxygenated, but there's low nutrients. Low nutrients, very little phytoplankton. Can't really have much primary, secondary productivity. The dissolved CO2, this is how we sequester CO2 from the atmosphere into the sediments. If you slow down or shut this deep water formation off here, you do not sequester the CO2. You're going to keep CO2 levels higher in the atmosphere. And we all know what that means in terms of global temperatures. Also, you know, the CO2 helps to find the lysocline. Again, I did a video ex explaining the calcite compensation depth and so on. So please check that out. And as well as check out my isotopic fractionation video. So AMOC is important because as the North Atlantic deep water moves further south, it gradually starts to heat up as it's friction of other water masses, which imparts heat, making it less dense, becomes more buoyant. It starts to rise first into the intermediate waters, then finally all the way to the surface at the region called the Antarctic Divergent Zone. As it upwells, nutrients are brought to the surface, and this process is a major reason why the Southern Ocean is the most productive open ocean region on the planet. AMOC slows, shuts down, this food web collapses. So ocean waters that are more dense in the upper layers will sink until they encounter water masses of similar density where buoyant forces counter any gravitational forces. We see this in the North Atlantic as surface water sink until about 1,000 meters or so, becoming the North Atlantic deep water, NADW. Winds cause surface currents, which are horizontal. This is aside from the Ekman spiral, Ekman spiral downward, vertically. But it is these changes in temperature and salinity, just and thus changes in density that create and drive vertical currents, which are collectively are referred to as thermal hailing circulation. Changes in temperature, changes in salinity, changes the density, which then creates the thermal hailing circulation, which are vertical movements. Vertical water movements is a way to sequester materials from the surface to deep water, such as CO2, detritus, and oxygen, just as I showed you here. This vertical movement also helps to what we call ventilate the ocean. Fancy way of saying major mixing. If there's no deep water, vertical flow, this does not happen. So there's no deep water vertical flow, this will not happen. Ventilation. We have data that shows during ice ages, there's little to no ventilation of the oceans, but there is ventilation during interglacials. So no mixing during ice ages because you get uh, stratification. And there's no ventilation during into, uh, and there is ventilation mixing during interglacials. Mixing followed by stratification is required to have productivity. This is true whether it's in the ocean or in freshwater. In the ocean, there is a seasonal thermal pycno hailing climb, which occurs in surface waters. There is deeper, a deeper, more permanent pycno climb, about 1,500 meters or so, in the water column, anywhere in the range of 1,000, 1,500 meters. If warming of the surface waters continue, especially in the tropics, but it's, it could also move further to mid and higher latitudes. There is a strong possibility that the upper thermal climb may not break down, allowing for nutrient mixing, but may become another permanent, more shallow, or much longer lasting stratification layer, such that pro primary productivity in those regions of the oceans is slowed or stopped altogether, which will collapse whatever little food web that takes place there. Humans get a large proportion of their food from the ocean. This will create food shortage issues leading to potential starvation. So if I can just, uh, yeah. So this might become more persistent. But as it cools down, even tropical, there is a little bit of a breakdown, so you can't get some uh, mixing. So this is the upper mix layer. There is a, you know, a seasonal, Within this upper mix layer, there's this little seasonal thermocline that occurs very shallow within the first 100 meters or so. That is where you get some pro uh, productivity taking place. 
if that little mix seasonal mix layer persists or becomes another permanent pycnocline or thermocline, then any little productivity that takes place there will not take place. So there you have it. So to kind of try and sum up here, vertical mixing regime in lakes is pretty straightforward. It's temperature dependent, and that should be fairly understandable. But in the ocean, first of all, the area and volume considered, it's dependent on temperature and salt content, salinity. If you want, you're going to have in the tropics, you're going to have, you know, that warm upper layer water as it cools down because of seasonal changes, as small as they are, you're going to get a little bit of mixing. You can't get some productivity there. So you're going to get a, season, a, a seasonal uh, layer. And this is really uh, important in temperate zones. You definitely see one there. And that does break down as we move into fall in winter. Okay. Look at those. Uh, that, that's what, uh, let's see, find that. That graph here, right? Here, here is that breakdown, right? Some of you get that little stratification. This is for like mid latitudes. That breaks down, but you're going to get productivity in there. In the tropics, because of the depth, you're going to get very little, if any, productivity here. But in wintertime, this breaks down. So you see how this goes right to the surface? There's your mixing. You get the stratification in the summertime, but you lock in the nutrients and your organisms go to town. This is in danger of either extending its duration or becoming permanent in its own right. In other words, this branch of the line will disappear. So it's going to go this way. If that happens, you're going to lose the productivity in the temperate latitudes. That's what I'm trying to say there. But when you get to the uh, high latitudes, the, you have the complete vertical mixing due to the thermal halines flow due to the salt content making very dense cold water that sinks. And it sinks, it moves southward, or moves to lower latitudes, okay? Moving northward from the southern pole. So it's going to move to more tropical latitudes, and this is going to mix the entire vertical regime of the ocean. Eventually, some of it upwells, further mixing, but brings nutrients from below. So in the tropics, very little mixing. Not, there is some, but very little because it's warm. You get into the temperate zone, you're going to form that seasonal thermal climb where you're going to get the productivity. That breaks down in the temperate zone. When you get to high latitudes there, you're going to have you're not going to really see a thermal climb. You might see halo climb, but the halo climb is already the deep cold water sinking. And that deep cold water is reduced is the result of sea ice forming. Okay. That breaks down in the summertime when that sea ice melts. And you can maybe you know, as the rivers start melting from the continents and they start adding riverine inputs. And then you can get a stratification, and that stratification will lead to productivity. It could be ice edge productivity, it could be pelagic productivity. But losing the uh, sea ice. Is going to we're going to lose that ice edge productivity community. You're going to have to wait later in the year for the pelagic community to do its thing. The overall result is reduced productivity. So we see it's a more complicated system with the ocean, but even these small subtle changes in salinity is sufficient to drive density current, as is small changes in temperature. Changes in temperature, changes in salinity will drive vertical current, thermal halion circulation, and these vertical currents are what mixes the ocean. When AMOX slows down, when AMOX slows down and shuts down, that mixing, vertical mixing regime is cut off, and then you start having problems with the deeper water layers. You don't get that mixing. You don't get that ventilation. You just don't. Whereas when you have the, the conveyor belt running, you get that mixing and the ventilation. And when you have that mixing and ventilation, you also sequestering materials. And as I said, in my uh, video on isotopic tra uh, 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 fractionation, I spoke about how looking at the sediment and ice cores, we can reconstruct past climate. We can tell you when the conveyor belt was running or not.
So I hope you found there's a lot of material here, there's a lot to digest. You know, you know, feel free to watch it several times or rewatch the certain segments several times, whatever. Stop the video, stare at the you know, the, the graphics here. But I hope you found this informative. I hope you have a better handle on on what goes on. And I hope like how I didn't confuse the crap out of you guys. <laughs> but uh, uh in all seriousness, I hope you found this informative and um uh, that you now have a better handle on what drives mixing, stratification in water systems, be it fresh or oceanic. Thank you for your time and thank you for your patience and bearing with me through this lengthy presentation. We'll talk soon. Hey friends, this is Jim reminding you to subscribe and share my videos. Also, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I drop a video in. And I'm also asking to, for you to please support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your continued support.